now have the Old Testament scripture reading. There's two uh, brief readings, and the first one is from Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26. It's on page 1 of your pew Bible, if you like to follow. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And the second reading is from Job, chapter 33, verse 4. Again, it's on page 469 in the Bible. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. This is today's scripture reading for all God's people. First, I want to um, thank you, first of all, for allowing me to be here this morning. It is my honor. I've been a member of Concord United Methodist Church um, for over almost 30 years now. Um, I, when I moved here from um, the Bronx, New York, um, I moved to the Concord area, and this is a wonderful story. And I walked into the Methodist Church because I'm sixth generation Methodist. And once I um, finish with my theology degree, I will be the sixth generation of ministers, of Methodist ministers in my family. They've been waiting. <laughs> Taking me some time. But it's um, always, a, I walked into Concord United Methodist Church and at the time, coming straight out of the Bronx and out of a, a neighborhood that was very multicultural. And um, I looked, of course, in the phone book, so it was in the phone book at that time that I found um, the church. And I walked in, and I looked around, and I thought, hmm, this doesn't look like my church. Um, <laughs> and as I proceeded to turn around and try to sort of jockey out of the back door, um, one of our pastors, uh, Sidney Cheryl, uh, Pastor Cheryl, grabbed my hand. And he goes, where are you going? And I'm like, out. <laughs> <laughs> out. And he said, no, sit and stay. So I sat and I stayed. And I listened to the choir, because music is the universal language of all things. It breaks all barriers. And I thought, oh, well, they can sing. <laughs> And um, later on, he said to me, he said, I know exactly how you feel. And I thought, that's not possible. <laughs> but he, um, his first appointment was at a church in Chicago, and it was an all-black church. And when he walked in, <laughs> he felt exactly how I felt. But then we, we began to meet and have Bible study together, and try to answer that question why we felt that way. Being that we were Methodists, and being that we were believers, why was it that I felt that I wouldn't be welcome there? And why was it that he felt, even as a pastor, that he might have some problems there? So for like 10 years, he and I studied the Bible and had much conversation around that. And eventually we decided it is because we take on the secular law before we take on the divine law. And the divine law says there is no difference. But we seem to forget that once we walk out into the world. Because we take on titles, like I have a title, I have lots of titles, but executive director, CEO, mom, board member, we take those titles on. And then I'm fortunate enough to have had the tenacity to sit in a classroom many, many times, so I have lots of degrees that mean absolutely <coughs> nothing, just that I had the tenacity to sit in the classroom. And the reality is, we take those on, and all of a sudden, those things become our value. They become who we are. When we go to parties, the first thing we ask people is, what do you do? We don't say, how's your soul? I want to know what you do. 
Then I'm gonna, when, I, when you go out into the parking lot, I'm gonna really, from the side of my eye, see what kind of car you drive. <laughs> and I'm gonna find out if it's new or old. And I may, may never say anything to you about it, but I'm also gonna try to figure out where you shop. Because if you shop at JCPenney versus Nordstrom's, that says something about you to some people. If you go through the tunnel to work, like I do, that may say something about me in the, real, in, the, in the other world. And in the other world, whether I live in a house, or I rent, or I own a condo, or I live in a car, or I live in, near the BART station, says a lot about me. I take the train a lot to Sacramento because I'm an advocate and a lobbyist for seniors up there. And one day I happened to really look out of the window. And as you go up to Sacramento, after you pass, or right before Davis, if you look out of the window to the right, there are people living in tents. All the way up to Sacramento, all the way up to the Capitol. Isn't that amazing? And I thought, the first time I saw that, I thought, Wow, that's really strange that that's happening. Close to Davis, where the average income, you wanna know what the average income is in Davis? It's pretty high, it's pretty high. But the second time I did it, I looked and I realized these people had a community because in front of their tents, they had little carpets and they had chairs that were welcoming. And then I thought, I gotta meet those people. So I took my car a couple of weeks after that and I went to meet those people. Even the fact that I call them in my head and I'm saying to you now, those people says volumes. Language destroys us. And I had an opportunity to meet these incredible human beings who are just like you and me. They just lost their job, and they lost their home, and somebody got tired of them living in their garage or on their couch, and so now they've created their own community. And I thought, I gotta save them, right? And after a couple weeks of going back and forth and visiting them and creating, bringing food and all of that, I realized they didn't need me to save them. They were saving me. Because now when I go to San Francisco and I get off on Powell Street, going to one of my high executive looking really beautiful in my cute little outfit, when I take the escalator up the stairs, I no longer step over. And I no longer not notice the man who everybody would say, look at that drunk bum. Or if they didn't say it, they would think it. And they're no longer invisible to me any longer because those were human beings who look like me, sound like me, and they are me. And they're you. We have to be careful because we all have unconscious biases. They exist, it's okay, you have permission. It's all right. I have a really good friend, she's Jewish. I love her. But when we first met 20 years ago in New York, she said to me, I don't see color. And I thought about that for a minute. And I said, oh my gosh, I need to take you to an ophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> I later teased her and said, you were trying to be so politically correct that if you made yourself blind, colorblind, of course we see color, and of course we see differences, and we should. But instead of looking at them as a negative and looking at them as a place of where, why aren't they like me, we should be more thankful and look at them like I look at, I have a wonderful garden at my house, and I am thankful that a lot of stuff grows there. It would be really boring if there were nothing but mums in my garden. Like them, 
like them very much. But I got a whole bunch of stuff. And that's what makes the garden rich. And that's what makes it a garden that flourishes. Because while one flower is dead, another one is blooming. While one is dying and nourishing the ground, another one is a seedling waiting for that nourishment to come through. So when we look at ourselves as divine beings, we no longer look at ourselves based on our sexuality, based on where we live, based upon our color, based upon how old we are, based upon how young we are, based upon what house we live in, or our paychecks, or the things that we happen to be able to collect in our homes. When we look at ourselves from a divine place, when we know that we are a part of a wonderful divineness, a creation, and that the great I am is our father, we position ourselves very differently in the world. I have the honor of working with international students. And last night I said goodbye to another four set of them. Um, one of them is from uh, Germany. The other is from South Africa. Uh, one, he, the other one was from India. And then the other gentleman was from South America, one of my, one of my loves. I love South America. Um, and last year, I had a person from Zambia, a person from Turkey, a person from Belgium, and a person from Singapore. And we always, their last night, come to my house and hang out, and I cook for them. It's always so much fun. And I realized last night what a wonderful gift they have given me because they came here, because I make them tell me, what, what did you learn? You know, as a, as a professor, I also teach at UC Berkeley, so as a professor, I'm always trying to figure out what people, t what they've learned. Because it's one thing to sit in a classroom, but if you've learned nothing, what, you know, it's, you know, like the one person that asked me if they could um, start their Easter break early and not take the test until they came back. Oh. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you can. You can do that, but you can also fail. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, when I was sitting around the fire with them, around the pit outside, I realized what a blessing it was to have this universal family that I didn't have before. That I now know what, where Moldova is. Do you know where Moldova is? Have you, you know, it's like Moldova is near Romania. And I didn't know where Moldova was. So I had to go, f and I, I found out I also don't have any globes or maps in my house. I went scurrying through the garage thinking one of my kids had left a globe or something, because I think I was a good parent and had a globe, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> so we had to, of course, use our cell phones, trusty technology, to find Moldova. And so now I know where Moldova is. And I have this wonderful, people in Moldova have great stuff in their water, by the way. Because this young lady is the most gracious, most humble, most beautiful person I've ever met in my life. And when I asked her what her wish is, she said to be a light in the world. She's only 22 years old. Isn't that special? And I said to her, well, how are you going to do that? And she said, I'm going to go out into the world and meet everybody that I can and share God's love with them. And hopefully, at the end of the day also, Michelle, I'm going to go back to Moldova and tell them that, because this, this was my hope for her, she goes that not all black people are like we see on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yay! Because <laughs> they're behind in Moldova. So they're seeing things like um, the Jeffersons and, you know, because when she came to my house, she said, oh my gosh, you don't live in a Project? I'm like, no, I live in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> Concord doesn't have projects compared to the projects I grew up around. So if we want to live by divine law, we must follow Jesus. And it's not enough to come and to pray and to, and to, to be at his feet at the cross. It is to behave like him. 
I, I love Jesus. I, you know, there were times that I sit down and I, and I fantasize about if I had been a disciple, like when he hung out with me, right? And especially in my 20s, because the person you see before you is not the person I was in my 20s. And even a little into my 30s. Would he have taken time with me? And the answer is yes. And if we think we're holier and bound that he would have chosen us, we already know he didn't choose the Pharisees, did he? He went out into the world and chose the people that were more worldly because he wanted to make an impact and make a change and say to those people who thought they were holier than thou and really following God's word, which they were not, this is the way. This is the way. This is the path. And that means loving as I love you. Forgive as I have forgiven you. Be humble as I am humble because I am getting ready. Jesus knew he was going to be on the cross when he got here. He knew that. But he was willing to make that sacrifice for us through that blood, that sacrificial blood. No more lambs being sacrificed. The human sacrifice so that we could live in the freedom of understanding that we need to follow divine law and take care of each other. I have a sign on my front door in my office that says, be gentler than you need to be. So when people come in my office, they will be gentle with me. Because <laughs> usually they're complaining about something. So I put that up there so they have to look at it so they can be gentle. Try gently with each other. <laughs> I love Job um, 33.4, and I'm going to go over that really quickly with you before I have to leave you today. The Spirit of God has made me the breath of the Almighty, and it gives me life. Wow. I know. Doesn't it, it's just, this lady's over here breathing. I love that. that. It's just like, wow, right? If you know that the Almighty God, the Infinite Father, it's breathing life into you every single day. How dare you go out into the world and act like you don't know it? Every day, you wake up. Oh my gosh. You know, it's getting a little harder for me to get my feet to the ground than it used to be. I actually got, my, I got a lower bed. I used to have one of those beds like this. Now I got a lower bed. And I roll in the car a little bit differently than I used to. Got a bigger car. But the reality is, I'm thankful every morning. When I look in the mirror, I just thank God so much that I'm here, that I'm breathing, that I'm alive, and that I have an opportunity to be a difference in the world. What's your difference? Who do you want to become during this Easter season? Is it about the straw hat and the lovely gloves and the Easter eggs? Yeah, a little bit. That's fun. I got one. I got a, I got a cute little hat for Easter. <laughs> but it's also being filled with the joy of knowing that I have an obligation to each and every one of you in this room to be the best that I can be so that you can be the best you can be, so that when you come across me, all you see is love, no judgment, because who am I to judge you? The sacrifice has already been given. And it's up to me to make sure that I show you that I understand that love and that I understand that breath. And so, as my brothers and sisters, I ask you to do the same for the people in the community that you live in. You're never too old. You're never too young. We can still show what divine law means. Quick VBS story. I've taught VBS or been a part of the VBS VBS has taught me for a very long time. And I, I'm very childlike. I am very childlike. I mean, the Peter Pan principle definitely lives within me. <laughs> and I was sitting on the floor with a little girl, and we were um, walking on water. I found a recipe so the kids could walk on water in a pool. And so afterwards, we were sitting down, and the bottom of our feet she was facing me and I was facing her and our bottom of our feet were like this, together. And all of a sudden she looked up at me, she's a cute little girl, 
little freckles, the reddest hair, the hair that I put, I get in a bottle to put in my hair. Um, red, red, red. And she looked at me and then she said, well, why did God make your skin brown and the bottom of your feet the same color as mine? <laughs> I was like, whoa. Um, <laughs> And I do have actually a certificate in religious training, but I didn't know the answer to that. <laughs> but, um, but what I said to her was, I said, but isn't it cool that there is something that we have that's alike, that makes us the same? And that's the part of us that God wanted us to, to have to be the same. I'm so thankful to tell you that she went through Sunday school, she went through confirmation class, she went to college, and I remained her friend, and I still live am her friend. And every year, I always say to her, how's the bottom of your feet? <laughs> so I'm going to close with, how are the bottom of your feet? The part of you that is, that's the same as everybody else. The Sierra Service Project kids are, get, are finding out what the bottom of their feet is like. So go out, pound the bottom of your feet. Join them up, because that's the part of us, if you really want to talk about differences, that's the same. I have a couple bunions, so I might be a little different than you. Um, but not that much. Let's pray. Father God, in this multicultural cornucopia of humanity, help us to find the divine law in our hearts that says that we are sisters and brothers in your name. Let us know that there is no age, there is no gender, there is nothing about another human being that we have the right to be upset about. That we must always reach out in love and kindness and in forgiveness as you have forgiven each of us. And I know me for all the skeletons that are in my closet. And so none of us are perfect and Father, as we go out into the world and we come to church every Sunday, let us be mindful of that. And then go back out into the world and let people stop saying, oh, those Christians, you know how they are. They don't really want us there. Let them say, yes, those Christians, we want to be a part of that. Because those are loving, caring people who don't care whether I smell who don't care whether what my sexuality is. They don't care where I live. They don't care what the color of my hair is because they know that the bottom of my feet ties me to them. And Jesus, who washed the feet of every person that he came across, let us be an example. And I pray for this church, and I pray for Pastor Lee, and I pray for those young children. Bring them back so that they can give the breath of life to this community and this Easter season, let us change and let us become whole. Let us be the true meaning. And we name this and we claim this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.